Okay, so we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, we really do our best to keep this at the hour. I uh, know everybody's calling in, um, well, pending on where you are in the United States. If you're East Coast, you're calling in probably during your lunch hour. Uh, so welcome everybody to the boardroom. My name is Jennifer Minocchio. I am the co-founder of the boardroom along with Claire Powell, who is also on the line. And we have an amazing group of women today who will be talking about how we can all be more inclusive in the workplace and in our thinking. And I know we're very eager to hear from everybody. So I'm just gonna take a little bit of time, a minute or two here to tell you a little bit about the boardroom, talk um, quickly about some housekeeping um, items in terms of how we run this call, and then uh, we'll introduce our panelists and get started. So in terms of the boardroom, we are a volunteer run organization and we focus on advancing women to higher levels of leadership. And we do this per, by providing free access to C-suite leaders through webinars and on-demand content. And we really want anybody at any level in their career, from students to professionals to retirees, and from any background, you know, regardless of where you are um, in terms of uh, industry, whether it's nonprofit, education, government, corporate, and entrepreneurs. And the best way to follow us and get upcoming information, we actually dropped it into the chat. So you'll see it there. Our website is www.totheboardroom.com. And we are um, keep our LinkedIn page very updated uh, with, again, on-demand content, updated information on events that are, that are coming up in the future. Uh, just so everybody knows, uh, we literally just launched the boardroom in September, and we couldn't be more excited about the support that we're getting across the country um, and the women that, that we are impacting. So just a couple quick housekeeping notes about today. Uh, we, we, our panelists um, will uh, run the session for about 45 minutes. We will leave about 15 minutes at the end for a Q&A. So if you have any questions for the attendees as we're going through, feel free to drop them into the chat. Um, we are not gonna answer them as you're posting them, but we'll hold those um, and collect those at the end and, and ask the panelists the question. So please feel free to use the chat function within Teams. Um, also, please make sure to keep yourself muted throughout the session just so everybody can hear the panelists clearly. Um, feel free to leave on your video if you like or turn it off, whatever you're most comfortable with. Uh, and that's it. That's that's the that's the kickoff um, and kind of the housekeeping things that I had for today. And so without further ado, I wanted to introduce our moderator and our panelists. So we have Jamila Conley, who is the VP of Global Talent at F5, which is an international tech firm. She's from Seattle and will be moderating uh, our panelists today, which include we have Brooke Lampert, who is director of UNCW's LGBTQIA Resource Center. We have Danielle Roseborough, who is the chief diversity officer and also a professor at UNCW. Uh, we have Adele Sejo Villa, who is head of Centro Hispano and Latino Alliance. And last but not least, we have Tiffany Tucker, who is the Deputy Director of Athletics at UNCW. Powerhouse of women that we have today, and we're so honored to have them all. So thank you all to our panelists for your time, and thank you all for joining us. And I'm going to hand this over to Jamila. Thank you, Jen, and uh, thank you, Claire, for inviting me and allowing me to be your moderator today. Um, uh, this should be a very um, great session. Looking forward to be pretty interactive with questions at the end and interactive with the panelists. As you heard, we have some great panelists, so um, let's um, let's dive right in. So today's session will be centered around several themes themes to discuss how we navigate leadership and success in, in any workplace. Today we're highlighting academia, and we really want to unlock what are the secrets to success that have been traditionally Tail, not tailored to women or people of color in most work environments. And we're hoping to unlock some of those doors and start thinking about how do we produce a more inclusive world? I love seeing the turnout today. And I saw that there's a few, a few men joining us today and we need more of that. So I'm happy for the men that have joined as well as, you know, 
all the the women and people of color that are here to to learn and continue to grow of what does inclusive leadership look like um and so with that what my question to each of the panelists to get us started is to share an experience that really unlocked your passion around dni and how you could begin to make impact on helping women and di diverse groups succeed um i will start with um tiffany um our time to about three minutes per person because i know we have a lot to cover today well thank you so much first and foremost thanks so much for allowing me to be here um and i'm going to pardon my voice because it's doing some crazy stuff today but i want to say the first time um it truly unlocked for me was in high school and i'm from the state of virginia and women's basketball girls basketball at that time was played during football season and if you know anything about athletics and recruiting during football season, you still have an opportunity to possibly play with your club teams or your AAU teams. So for, for us, the women at my school in my district, we had to pretty much stop playing club for three, four months before everyone else in the country. And that limited our opportunities in the role, in the way of recruiting and being seen by college, um, college coaches. Um, however, little to my knowledge, I found out a, a, a couple years after the legislation changed that there were some women and there were some moms that had gotten together and pretty much sued because they felt their daughters were put at a disadvantage in which you were. You know, I had an opportunity to play at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, you know, but what about the other women that or young girls that didn't have an opportunity to be seen by college coaches because they were put at a disadvantage because at the end of club year or AAU season, they were not allowed to be, you know, they didn't have the opportunity to go play in some of the higher end tournaments because they had to come back and play in their, um, their high school. So that was the first time the light bulb kind of went off for me because it was like, why do they get to do this? And we don't you know, get this opportunity. And um, I think that really like opened my eyes to um, girls are different. You know, boys are superior, trying to figure out where my role was and, and how I navigated that. But Jamila, that was the first time for me, it really opened my eyes. Well, thanks for sharing. And it's great to hear that that passion was instilled at you and in a young age that has helped you throughout, you know, kind of throughout your career of how you think about how the world is different. Danielle, how about you? Hey, thank you, Jamila. I actually have two instances that I'm gonna to try to combine really quickly to in the time frame. So one of course happened in high school, similar to, to what Tiffany talks about. I was a high school social studies teacher. My classroom happened to be connected to a classroom that was across the hall from the girls locker room, the women's locker room. And we had some guests come by one day with the principal, and it turns out that they were looking at closing the girls' locker room to turn it into in-school suspension. Now, mind you, I coach cheerleading. I never cheered a day in my life. That's another story. But I had to say something. And I just, high school teacher, I thought, wouldn't that be a Title IX violation? Like, I don't know, but it just seems like you can't just close the girls' locker room. And they didn't close it. Second instance that happened to me was in college and I went to Russia. This was my senior year in college and we were sitting around the table. I was the only black student or student of color on the trip and they got into a conversation about admissions and started to say, you know, I had a white friend who was admitted to Carolina. I had a, you know, black friend that was admitted. The white friend had a, had a higher SAT score and didn't get in. And I remember having this same thought, if I don't say something, who will? So I got myself together and responded, you know, of all the qualifications or criteria for admissions, SAT score is only one. And I'm also sure there's probably another white student that had a lower SAT score than your white friend. So we don't know all that we need to know to make an informed judgment on this process. And I was scared to death. So I say all that to say, those two instances taught me that I couldn't necessarily pass the responsibility for a response to someone else. I couldn't hope that they would learn from someone else, that I had to 
to figure out how to be engaged in the conversation. Oh, that's an that's an amazing story. And it's starting to touch on something we'll talk about a little bit later of allyship. So I love the if I don't say something, who will? And just love that, love that sense of bravery in your story. Uh, Brooke, how about you? Sure, thank you. Um, thanks for, for being here, everyone. Um, so so quickly, my story, um, I my my degrees are in education. So specifically, I went to school, went to um, college to be a, a high school teacher. That was that was a plan, a high school teacher and a coach. Um, and, you know, so I taught and coached um, high school for about four years before I switched into higher education. And the catalyst for that switch was actually my own experience working as a um, queer professional and how unprepared I was for how my identity was going to come into play on a daily basis, um, working in education, working in high schools, working with um, students, working with parents, working with administration, and how uncomfortable, you know, the administration was in with conversations with me or um, how uncomfortable parents were that I was, you know, teaching their 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 kids or how uncomfortable parents were that I was coaching their kids. Meanwhile, for the most part, the students had no issue and and there was not, you know, if anything, I had a lot of students uh, wanting to take my classes and having very open dialogue in those classes. But as a professional, it was not a good place for me to be. And so I started talking with some close friends of mine about, you know, like this, I just, I can't keep doing this. Like this is not a, a healthy environment for me to be in. And I felt, I just felt so unprepared as to how I, I needed to handle that. And so as I left, you know, secondary education, um, and that kind of initial career path, one of the reasons why I got into DEI was to help other students and other folks kind of navigate their identity and and have you know these conversations about how their identity may come into play um, as they're navigating the workplace and how that works and how do we do that as minoritized individuals? How do we navigate these workplaces that are not set up for us to be successful? Um, and so that's kind of how I, you know, shifted into to what I'm doing now. That's amazing. And I love hearing you. Uh, thank you for sharing that story, because I think one of the things that you're hitting on that a lot of people that may not be part of a underrepresented group in several different ways, intersectionality plays in here, that sometimes there's a thought of, if I'm not X, I don't feel comfortable talking about them. They don't always realize on the other side that I am X and I don't know either. And that's why, and again, we'll talk about allyship, but it's a two-way street of how you open up that communication channel. And sometimes a lot of the pressure and onus is put on the underrepresented person as if you're supposed to have all the answers and be prepared for this and you're not. And you know, and as we think about how to be more inclusive across the board, not even just in leadership, how important that plays. But like I said, we'll get into that conversation, but wonderful. Um, thank you for opening up and, and sharing that. And then last but not least, Adele, can you share an experience? Well, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for having me. And it's, this is a huge homecoming for me. I see a lot of familiar faces, hugs to all. Good to see you. Uh, well, uh, my story really, I've been very, very fortunate, very, very blessed. And I would say that my uh, my advocacy and support for women really begins uh, at, the, at the nest. Uh, and I, I, I give kudos to, to my both of my, mater, my, my maternal grandmother and my paternal grandmother. Uh, my, uh, my dad is one of eight boys uh, in a military house. Uh, and my granddaddy was a general, but we always say that grandma truly was the general who expected their only daughter to accomplish just as much and have as many ranks, titles, and everything else, and opportunities as so as did uh, the other eight boys. So and so, um, I was the first uh, one of the first uh, grandchildren to come into the into the family, and I haven't asked my dad this question, but I wonder truly if he raised me as as a son. And I say that because. 
uh, today's society has certain expectations to this day uh, that are very gender stereotyped. Uh, and so I was very fortunate to be exposed to and uh, be expected to um, tend to some things that my uh, male cousins were exposed to, uh, things from just mechanics to uh, things that are very like engineering type problem solving. So that mentality, I owe, I really owe that to my grandmother in not uh, uh, shaping us or folding us to fall into the gender stereotype and truly opening up all the opportunities very, very early, very early on. Um, that was uh, emphasized, ironically enough, by going to an all-girls all school by a very modern American nuns who expected also us to be um, not, not just self-sufficient, but truly self-reliant in knowing that our biology may lead us to motherhood one day or by adoption lead us to motherhood one day, but that the, we needed to be the ones really responsible for our ship. Uh, and so that, uh, does that strength continue to be, uh, the strength that I had from the nest, from my, my home, continue to be emphasized uh, through my uh, elementary and middle school until I migrated to the U.S. Now, that uh, strength that I felt uh, in decision-making led me to change my career very much like a, a couple of you mentioned. Um, I, I found myself at a public school teaching Spanish, kudos to all my fellow teachers, uh, only to realize that there was this community, this population that was very much forgotten, and that was the immigrant community, and in particular in, in Western North Carolina, the migrant farm workers collecting our Christmas trees, harvesting our Christmas trees. So I found myself um, teaching a wonderful uh, class in Spanish and uh, found uh, the incoming ESL immigrant and migrant children really had no support system. So I saw myself facing this decision and it was like, it was a no brainer, and it, almost like lightning just kind of stroke. Uh, and said, I, this is my last year teaching Spanish. So I went back to uh, school to get my license to teach English. And I have been serving the immigrant and uh, migrant communities uh, ever since. I saw myself in that student coming into uh, to, uh, a space where I was uh, the other and I didn't quite have the resources that would have been nice to have. So um, definitely uh, continue to just uh, use that as my passion to, to support um anyone that i can in that fashion awesome thank you for sharing and it, it's great to hear that basically diversity was kind of built into your dna and it gave you the tools to be able to recognize when you were the other and how you could be how you could be of help and service um so now we'll move into our themes but first i just want to say thank you for sharing each of your experiences and being vulnerable in those in in that sharing um I'd love to start with storytelling like this because one, it humanizes and lets everyone know that you've been through something. So everything that you're about to share is coming from a very real place and a very passionate place. And I really appreciate that. So our first theme today is the power of networks. And I think one of the things that's not stressed enough, especially at the high school going into college level, for many women, girls, people of color, is how important it is to start building your networks early. And who are those people who are going to be in your corner, can help you answer those tough questions, and even the stupid ones, um, as you're starting your career, but to be able to create that safe space. So Adele, I'll start with you. And can you tell us your thoughts on why building networks and a personal board I, I know there's a lot of talk about personal boards. They can be formal, informal, but why is that so important? Can you talk a little bit about that? Yes, well, uh, from where I stand, uh, the building networks is truly an extension to uh, your resources. It truly is a window of opportunity. And that opportunity and those resources may be an extension uh, of uh, your experience, uh, information, that may actually turn into um, dollar signs. Through your network, if you were looking for a certain service or a certain space, it may be that you get you know, a, a, um, a family rate, uh, or it may be that because of your network, the, maybe the service or the, the product that you are putting out uh, there maybe 
have added value. Um, this may also be a bridge into some area that you're trying to navigate uh, a new opportunity or access to something new. Just on a personal note, it was the network uh, when my family fled Peru, we knew that we were headed to the US. It was our network that actually landed us in Wilmington 34 years ago. You know, uh, uh, a local Wilmingtonian had done an exchange study in uh, Peru and my aunt from uh, Peru had come to Wilmington. So that network and that community just became the, the bridge to begin our new, our new life here in, in the U.S. And so speaking of board of uh, personal board of advisors, truly you're, le you're looking at somebody who truly has your best uh, interest at heart. So people that um, are going to uh, say like it is, not just your cheerleaders, but also uh, people that are gonna have that straight talk with you that become uh, as part of your network, the extension of your eyes and ears uh, in those blind spots that we may not have. And sometimes uh, it truly, if you have a, a, a true board of advisor that once was best for you, some of those conversations are not gonna be easy to hear. Uh, and it's going to be complete, uh, always changing. So just my two, my two cents on that. Awesome. Thank you. Um, and Danielle, I'll, I'll move over to you. Uh, maybe you can talk a little bit about how one should go about thinking about building out a network. I'm sure we have some um, younger, newer and career people. So it'd be great to know. And I'm sure we have a lot of people who coach other other people of, you know, giving them those tips and tricks of how do you go about starting to build your network? So this is an interesting question for me because I am an introvert by nature. So my entire life, I was the kid who was quiet and listened and I studied people. But in that studying people, I have found that I'm always connected to people who are huge extroverts, who I would call connectors as, um, you know, we've heard this term before. So being around connectors, I have often thought about, okay, I'm so thankful they're in my network. How do I make sure that it's reciprocal and I'm just not sucking energy and opportunity from them? So I always make sure that when I get connectors in my network, that I open up opportunities for them, that I connect them to other people that can help them find additional resources for, for whatever their projects are. So I honor their unique gifts. I also will say that a lot of us struggle with perfectionism and I struggled with that until I was a high school teacher and being a high school teacher, things are so crazy that you can't be, you just, it's, it's really hard to be a perfectionist. And so I learned the value of being present and just showing up and just showing up as my first objective has helped me deal with that perfectionism because I'll take advantage of an opportunity even if I don't think I'm going to be great at it. I will be present. And being present has opened up so many doors for me that I, I can't even explain. And then I'll also add this. I had to learn to be direct when making connections. So, you know, I'm like, oh, I don't want people to think I'm just out to get to know them because they are who they are. I will never forget. Several things have happened to me, but this one mattered the most probably. I was invited to, as, to contribute a book chapter. And this other professor who was well known, the late uh, Dr. Dennis Carlson, he used to be at Miami University of Ohio. He had all of us that he had invited to contribute to this book up at Miami University to talk about the book. He had this amazing grant from the Ford Foundation. And I was around all these fabulous scholars and I was sort of, you know, suffering from imposter syndrome. But then at the end of the weekend, on the way out the door, I literally said to him, you know, if you need help, let me know. And lo and behold, he reached out and not only did he say I need help, but he was a, a really authentic, honest academic who understood the gender dynamics and offered me the co-editorship of the book, which wow. a lot of people wouldn't have done. They just would have taken my labor for free. So I learned a lot about that. But the one thing I'll say, which is what I'll end with is I learned that I need to be clear sometimes. So I'm grateful that he was nice and kind and said, hey, do you want to be an editor? But I also needed to, to be clear about, you know, my intentions and what I hope to get out of that, that relationship. Understanding, we, what, we all enter these relationships wanting to keep our dignity intact, our ethics intact. We want, don't want to, to use people or misuse them. But at the same time, you need to build your network. So 
be upfront with people about what opportunities you're looking for and what you might need out of a particular professional relationship. That's great advice. Thank you so much. Um, Brooke, I want to move over to you and just ask, do you have a personal board? And if you do, how did you go about selecting who who's on your board? Yeah, absolutely. So um, I think what's what's interesting about this. Yes, I, I do have a, a personal board. Um, and I think what's interesting about this is I feel like this is one of the areas, again, where as a young professional, I wasn't really given any guidance, right? You just kind of like go off into the workplace and there isn't really a whole lot of guidance of like, oh, hey, you're going to need people in your corner. You're going to need to make these connections. You're going to need, you know, to to be talking with with folks and to find people that you trust within your industry to be able to have conversations about what's going on in the workplace. You know, these were all areas that I like just had not been given any sort of guidance on. Um, and so I felt um, the first couple of years, I would say, was I was just trying to like navigate things. And I would say over the last probably six or seven years, um, I feel like I've really been able to to build this uh group of folks around me or personal board of directors around me that have kind of ebbed and flowed a little bit depending on like what's going on. Um, but these are folks for me that are that I trust um, that have, you know, I have some folks um, that I would consider on my board as, you know, one person from my undergrad, right? We went to undergrad together. We were like best friends in undergrad and we went into different paths. She's a professor now. Um, so she's on the academic side of um, of higher education, but we run stuff by each other all the time. Like she'll she'll send me a message and say, hey, I'm doing X, Y, Z. What do you think of this? And I'll kind of do the same thing. Hey, I'm working with this population right here and this is what I'm doing. What do you think? Um, so for me, I would consider my board of directors pretty informal. It's not something that I've like sat down and said, OK, you're part of my board of directors now. But it's really for me this group of people from different areas um, in my either career or kind of adulthood that I've been able to build relationships with that, as Adele kind of already mentioned, that are not only my support system. They're trusted people that I go to, but they're also going to let me know like, hey, this might be a blind spot right here. So, you know, you know, I'm here for you and I'm going to support you and I'm going to help you navigate this. Um, but here's what I'm seeing as this might be a blind spot for you. And because we built that trusting relationship, I'm able to kind of take that in a little bit and say, OK, like I hear you. I hear what you're saying. Um, for me, I think it's also, you know, important to have, you know, mentors on. For me, that's been really helpful to have mentors on board of directors where people that have had similar positions in mind that we can again Hey, we're, I'm seeing this, you know, on, on this campus. Are you seeing the same thing? If so, how are you managing it? Or what are what conversations are you having or what programs are you having? So having people that have had um, similar experiences from me. And then I also like to have um, a leader or leaders, people that are above me that may be able to see a more um, broad uh idea as to what's going on you know i'll get in my you know i see my area right and if things are are happening and i'm having questions about you know where do i go from here it can be helpful to have somebody above you that can give you a little bit more of a broad understanding as to okay i see that this is what you're seeing but here's the bigger picture, right? Here's where we are moving together. And that might be something you need to take into consideration as you're kind of navigating this or making decisions. So I guess to answer your question, I do have a board of directors. Um, I would consider it more informal. And for me, it's been something just kind of picking people along the way that, you know, I've you know noticed something in them or we've just been able to build relationships. And as I'm navigating my own workplace, there are certain people that I go to depending on the situation, right? So if something comes up, my first thought is like, ooh, I need to go talk to this person at some point over the next couple of days to see what their take is on what's happening or, oh, I need to go and, and talk to this person. So it's for me, that's that is how I navigate uh, my board of directors. Awesome. Thank you for those those insights. And I think to quickly sum it up, what I heard is that you want to make sure you have people that you can trust who are going to tell you the truth 
you want to have diversity and skill set and experience industries in your in your board and it doesn't necessarily need to be formal i think that is absolutely great advice um i'm going to keep us moving here um as i thought the time is moving really quickly um so we'll move on to our next theme which is allyship and for me allyship is what helps create inclusive environments and you know we all learned from the summer of 2020 the social um the social injustice that happened how important allyship really is for underrepresented groups a lot of companies a lot of schools are putting a big focus on that so um tiffany i'm gonna have you kick us off on this one and i would love for you to give us some examples of what allyship looked like or looks like for you whether allies you've had or how you've been an ally. I'd love to just put some examples out there of what that's looked like for you. Uh, thank you, Jamila. One of the ways, you know, as a leader, um, as the deputy director of athletics working within our department, we have department heads for each area and having an opportunity to lead those folk. Um, it's, in, it's important that we go back to that word inclusive and making sure that people are seen and heard in their space, in their voice, because if you empower them to be the CEO of their area, then you should make sure you lean on them for that advice that they're an ex a subject matter expert in. And if we're hiring and we're, we're counting on them to be on top of trends and to be um, knowledgeable about what's going on with our students or student athletes, then you need to make sure that you're asking for their voice. And sometimes you get you get in the habit of in meetings where you're like, is there anything else anyone would like to ask? We've got to break that habit of kind of rushing through the meeting as opposed to saying, Danielle, is there anything that you can offer to this point? And then making sure that there's an opportunity if that's one if that's one area that Danielle brings up and then say, Brooke, is there any pushback or any gaps in there? You know, but all but I, I go back one more step. You have to build relationships with your folk in order to do that, because you don't want to make someone feel like you're picking on them or that you're forcing their voice to be heard when they really just want to be a fly on the wall that day. So, you know, you you've really you know step making that step all the way back is building that relationship, and that's one thing that I love about my group. That's one thing I love about our campus. And then the second example, you know, working in athletics, I'm so fortunate to be able to touch every department pretty much on campus. And I know true allyship, allyship true work in the DEI belonging space cannot be done alone. And I'm so grateful that I have the women that we, we have on the screen today. I work with them. I can call, I can pick up the phone, I can say, hey, this is something that's coming down the pipe with the NCAA. I need, I need us to lean in on this. And without a doubt, I know I have, I have them. But it also, in turn, exposes them to the national trends that are going on in my space because I use our, our athletics department almost as like this little community, this little tribe that looks like our 18,000 student campus. And if we can get it to work and we can get things to jail and if we can work together and create policy, create whether it's um, procedures around um, what we're going to do with trans athletes or what we're going to do with the new legislation around Title IX. If we can get it rolling in our department, then I know it's going to be what greater for our entire campus. But it first starts with building those relationships. Awesome. Thank you so much. And that that's very true. And so kind of continuing on this theme, Danielle, how has allyship helped get your voice heard and help you to be able to show your value? Well, that's a great question. <laughs> so many ways I'll try to hone in on a few. Probably the biggest one, given the position I am in now, representing the institution at a senior leadership level, is strategizing in groups about who can speak when. Because all of us cannot speak out against or for an issue at all times. I mean, we could, but given the positions and our connections, we have to strategize. 
who should speak when and why, because the world is political. It just, it really is. And so in my networks, we're always aware of each other's positionality and their institutional culture. So we talk about that, but we identify the problem and then we strategize who's gonna say what when. Second thing I'll point out is that allyship has allowed me opportunities. I mentioned this before, access to opportunities that I never would have even imagined, much less thought that I could benefit from or that I could take advantage of. So it's not just about being able to do more and see more. It's about understanding that other people have completely different perspectives from you and connections. And so they can bring you in, not just to do something different, but to think differently. And then last, and, and let me go back and I'll say that's helped me the most in grant collaborations. We all need funding. I have, have been so lucky and fortunate to have people reach out to me to say, hey, do you wanna be on this grant collaboration? And this is how this could benefit the people I work with most closely, but it also, my contribution can benefit the project. And last but not least, I'll add this, is this was hard for me, y'all, because even though I'm an introvert, when I want to say something, I wanna say it. It is understanding that the content, especially in DEI, the content, the point needs to be made so that people can hear it. It doesn't have to be me that says it. So how am I willing to step back and watch my beautiful, brilliant collaborators lead and be the voice that people actually hear so that we can affect some sort of transformation? So strategizing, I'll say again, um, access to opportunities, and then understanding that I don't have to be the person to say it, that it can be and should be sometimes somebody else. Yes, that's that's actually extremely key and a great leadership tip of becoming a great leader is how are you allies to the people that you're working with, whether they realize it or not. Um, Adele, I'm going to move over to you and I'm gonna ask you a question, and it's something that Danielle actually touched on um, earlier when she was talking about networks, but I would love to hear how allyship was able to help you with imposter syndrome. Yes, well, I would, I would begin by uh, just noting that imposter syndrome um, is felt differently by everybody and for many different reasons. Uh, you know, it may be that you uh, feel like you are uh, your age may be a reason for it, your ethnic background or racial background, your level of experience, if you're transitioning from one field to another. Uh, for me, it was language as well, uh, and my accent, which I, I know is still there, but um, imposter syndrome was something that I felt from the get-go, just coming into Wilmington, and, and not just that I'm an immigrant to the U.S., but an immigrant specifically to the city of Wilmington, which to this day, you know, we continue to see that we are, uh, we're making efforts away from it, but we're still a very self-segregated community. And so to be that, um, that very different than anybody, when I landed here, it was very much a, a, a black and white community. So that imposter syndrome was definitely felt uh, hard uh, before I even knew what imposter syndrome <laughs> meant. Uh, but the allyship really helps. Um, it, it really is a two-way street. I'm, I'm glad that Danielle mentioned the, the introvert in her. Uh, I definitely consider myself one as well. And the allyship really, I feel like it really is a two-way street. Um, uh, while the person going through or feeling the imposter syndrome, I really I think is is up to uh, to the surrounding environment to maybe spot it. Those of us that may have a, a relationship with with the individuals to to be there, to be present, and just to validate. Good job, you know. Uh, just to to have some kudos and some kind of um, uh, words, uh, words of affirmation. I don't know if you guys may be familiar with that, with the five love languages, words of affirmation for my entire life have, have been up there. And that just to hear the kudos to say, what well, good job, uh, a great input, things like that uh, mean so, so much. And that is truly what starts kind of climbing and getting me out of that imposter syndrome one step at a time one sticky note at a time, one kudos message at a time. So much so that I actually have in my uh, inbox for my emails, I actually have a subfolder that says praises and good notes. And it's like on a bad day, I would just kind of open it up and say, okay, today is a bad day, but you know what? 
there's plenty of other evidence that you're in the right track. And so I think just the being present and letting it be known to that person that uh, needs a, a little bit of a, of a positive note that, that you mean it. Yeah, a, a little bit goes a long way. I really want to leave time for some questions. So I have um, two more questions for the group. Um, I'd be remiss if we don't talk a little bit about it. So Brooke, I want to move to you. And because we're talking about allyship and a big part of allyship is sponsorship and mentorship. And I was just wondering if you can talk a little bit about the differences of ally of, I'm sorry, sponsorship and mentorship and how that has carved or helped you navigate in your career. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Um, so I, the way that I look at it, you know, mentorship, um, our folks, you know, our mentor is somebody, um, you know, in your network that's going to provide, you know, some guidance for you. Typically, they might have like similar background um, or similar experiences from you and um, can kind of help you navigate, um, you know, the role that you're currently in or the, the, um, uh, you know, institution that you're currently in, just kind of help you navigate those things. I would say a sponsor is is somebody that takes that a little bit further, right? So a sponsor um, is going to be somebody that's really going to advocate for you. Um, they might be in a in a position of leadership above you, um, and and sometimes the sponsorship can can form from mentorship. So maybe they were you know a previous mentor. And you've built a relationship with them. They understand your work. They understand what you're capable of. But a sponsor is really going to make sure that your name is is out there, that your name is is on the radar. Um, you know, they may do that by if they're in meetings with folks from you know above you, and there are promotions that are coming up, or talking about raises or other job opportunities. They may be putting your name out on the table. Um, to to kind of remind folks that that you're there. Um, they also may open doors, you know, for you with their network, right? So we can, you know, for for some folks, they may be opening those doors and saying, hey, um, you know, here's also my network of people, right? Or here's one or two key people from my network that I think, you know, might benefit you as well. And so when I think about the difference between sponsorship and mentorship. Um, I think there's a need for for both, right? Um, but folks um, kind of in that sponsorship roles are really the ones who are going to um, actively advocate for you and they're invested in your success as well. Um, and so I think that as I think about how that has played out in my professional experience, um, is again, those, those mentors are, you know, kind of those can be those trusted folks. Um, and then our sponsors are really the ones that might be opening up doors for us or letting us know about other opportunities, right? So they may be coming back and saying, Hey, you know, Brooke, I was in this meeting or I was meeting with these folks and here's some conversations that are happening. And, you know, I may, I put your name out, you know, for, for this or this or this, so be on the lookout for it, or really kind of helping you talk through like what's your what's your next level? Where are we going from here? I see this is what we're doing now, and let's talk about how we're going to move this forward as well. So that's kind of the way that I think about sponsorship and mentorship. Awesome, thank you. And you know, you, you said something. Um, well, you said a lot of key things, so I'm not going <laughs> to play that down, but. You know, the key thing about sponsorship, because the mentor, they're helping you navigate your career, but a sponsor, they have skin in the game. Like they, you know, they're they're putting, they're extending their network out there and their own brand out there for you. So if you find someone's doing that for you, don't take that lightly because they're putting some skin in the game. So I, I love, I love that point, Brooke. Um, so I just want to ask our audience, if you have questions, please start putting them in the chat. I'm going to ask one last question um, to our panel, but to each one of our panelists, and then we'll move to some Q&A. So start thinking of your questions and putting them in the chat so we can start addressing them. But my question to the panelists, and I will start with um, Danielle, but you all get the same question, is as we close today, 
at the end of this, this last piece of our conversation is that we can all be allies. It doesn't matter who you are. Um, it doesn't matter your background, but we can all be allies. So my question is, what's one small behavior change that we can suggest to the audience, to ourselves, that we can all do to be a, be be a better ally as we move back into our the regular course of our days um, to help create a better inclusive world. So Danielle, I'll start with you. Thank you. So I'll start with stop making assumptions. We say this all the time, but in so many relationships, so many challenges that people say they're having with each other, I have heard this more often than not. Well, I'm not going to tell that person because it won't change anything. So boss number one, colleague number two, whomever did X. People have all kinds of thoughts about whatever X was. We are all assuming certain things about the person's behavior, their intentions, whatever their motivations might be. And if we don't ask the person, if we don't bring it up with the person directly with care and compassion, we never give that person a chance to respond, to say, oh, actually, I never thought about that. Or culturally, I come from an entirely different perspective and would have never realized that you were interpreting my behavior that way. So I say all that to say there have been so many instances when I have been in a leadership role and two people have not gotten along. And then when I actually talk to those people and bring up the very specific behavior, somebody has said something that the other person had no idea was a part of their thinking. And it has changed their relationship and actually helped them to be able to communicate better. So give each other grace, but in that giving each other grace, just be direct. And the last thing I'll say about this is if you can't say it because of power issues, that's when you need to ally with somebody in the world I am in, tenured faculty, quote unquote, usually feel like they can speak more than non-tenured faculty. So find your allies and see who can say something and bring it up. Thank you. That's, that's great. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Tiffany, what are your thoughts on that question? Um, I kept going over and over. Was I going to say this? Was I going to say this? And I'm going to say it. If you cannot push another woman forward, get out of her way. Get out of her way. Because in this day and time, women are owning their power. And if you can't help push her forward, move her agenda forward, point her in the right direction, get out of her way. She's got stuff to do. She's got things to do. She's got something bigger than herself that needs to be done. So if you can't push her forward, just get out of her way. Thank you, y'all. That's awesome. I love that. Brooke, <laughs> sorry to fit you to have to follow for that. If I knew that was Tiffany's answer, I would have put her last. <laughs> I, I appreciate you. Thank you for recognizing that. I actually appreciate you recognizing that because I was going to say, I really don't want to follow that at all. I feel like that was like the mic drop moment. Right. Um, so thank you, Tiffany. Uh, this is this is great now. Um, all I was going to say uh, was that you are responsible for your own learning. And I don't know if that's like a, a big thing. You know, I know we asked for a small thing, um, but you are responsible for your own education. And so um, I am a big proponent of, of education. And that is your responsibility. It is not my responsibility. Well, I mean, it technically is because it's my job, but had it not been my job, right? It's not my responsibility um, as a queer professional to educate everyone um, about what that means or that identity. And, and I, so I think that we need to take ownership of our own learning and our own education and not put that onto anybody else. It is my responsibility to do that. It is my responsibility to do my own learning and to keep up on my own learning so that um, so that I don't bring my own, you know, biases into into a room. Right. And so I think that one of the things that I would like to see folks really take responsibility for is their own education and not leaving that up to to anybody else. And that's and that might be happening on your free time, too. Yep, absolutely. 
Um, and then last but not least, Adele. So I really have to share two, but I'll be super quick. So the first one is uh, anytime that you're supporting someone, uh, the teaching, a lot of us wants to just come up with solutions and just pour them out, but we really need to stop and ask that person, do you today, do you want me to listen or do you want me to give you my opinion? Because there's room for both and a time for each one of those. And then the other one is really to be uh, finding opportunities to be elevating each other. Just like Tiffany said, you know, just let all of us have places to get to get out of the way. If we we're not going to uh, if we're going to be in the way, but push also push each other to that light. There's plenty of nomination opportunities and sometimes representation is simply not there. So find ways to really uplift that unsung hero or somebody who truly deserves to have some of that spotlight. And also think about yourself in the allyship. Say, you know what? We sometimes we're just the worst at, at, at you know patting ourselves in the back and say, look, there's a great opportunity here. Would you mind nominating me for this one? I'll be nominating so and so for that one, and just truly uh, be strategic and be uh, conscious about it. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you for those insights. And thank you, ladies, for being such a great panel. Um, we have a couple of questions in the chat that I want to move to. Um, first, we have Casey, who has a question about she's leading a team of type A, uh, high performing type A white women in their 40s and 50s. And they just hired a African American man who she guesses is in his late 20s. And she's noticed that he doesn't say much in the meetings. And it's probably because of the culture that's been created. So her question is, is this something that she should talk to him directly about or should she adjust her style or their style to give him time and space to contribute? Who would like to answer that question? Jamila, I'll jump in real quick and it kind of goes back to what I was talking about with that inclusive leadership. Because it sounds like she's just in a space where if all of them are around, the other women are kind of taking over. And it goes back to build that relationship with him, kind of figure out how he communicates and how he wants to be spoken to. And then when he's when you're in those spaces where everyone's around, you may want to call his name. Hey, John, what are your thoughts on? And honestly, making sure that everybody else in the room is quiet and listens to what he has to say. Thank you. Um, we have another question here from Amy and her question. This is for you, Brooke. Um, and she's curious to know, do you think there's a certain cadence in which we should be meeting with mentors and sponsors? Um, and she hesitates to take up too much of their time because everyone's so busy. And would you say it is important to have ongoing weekly, biweekly, or monthly monthly meetings with a sponsor or mentor? Yeah, great question. I think that um, one of the most important parts of any successful relationship is going to be clear expectations. And so I think that um, setting up those expectations, and I think it's about what works for you and what works for that other individual. That might be a very formal meeting of like, hey, you know, I want to make sure that we're both using our time wise wisely. This is how I'm thinking about this relationship. Or it can be something a little bit more, you know, casual. And so I think it depends on you. I think it depends on the sponsorship or the mentorship. Um, but I think most importantly is having making sure that you both have very clear expectations so that you are not, um, you know, I think, you know, Danielle was already talking about communication earlier um, and making sure that we have clear communication. I think sometimes, you know, those relationships may not be successful if those expectations are not set up. So set up those clear expectations um, of, hey, you know, I would really like to meet with you, you know, every other week or once a month as we're kind of navigating this. And then you may have other mentors or sponsors that you can go to kind of like, hey, I had something come up this week and I'm wondering if we can, if I can get an hour of your time, you know, later in the week or sometime next week and letting them set those times up. You know, for me, sometimes I will send a message, I'll send a text. Um, to somebody and say, hey, you know, do you have an hour sometime later this week or next week that you and I can get together to talk through something? Um, and then that way, you know, we're both kind of setting that time aside and I'm not just randomly calling somebody or I'm not, 
you know, expecting them to respond to something right away. But that we're setting that that time aside specifically for us to have a conversation about whatever's going on. Awesome, thank you. Um, and then last question we have here is from Cora. And the question is, and Brooke, I think this question is for you again. Do you have any advice um, on someone starting off in the DEI space? Are there any resources to pay special attention to or participate in? Um, I will answer briefly and then if anybody else wants to jump in, um, I think it I think it depends on, you know, if we're looking at education, um, I mean, that's specifically the area that um, that I have experience in. Um, I would pay attention to what's already happening in the DEI spaces. So, for example, for our centers and what we have going on, if you're not already attending, you know, events that are going on, if you're not already attending dinners that are going on, if you're not already attending you know, folks have, you know, book clubs or weekly meetings. If you're not already attending those things, that's definitely something that I would that I would um, look into um, is to making sure that you're already connecting with those spaces if you're not already making those connections, right? Um, so that you're already familiar with what's going on. And a lot of those spaces, a lot of these DEI spaces will have different um, opportunities you know, I already mentioned book clubs will have different book clubs or different educational opportunities and workshops and panels such as this one, um, you know, to where you, you can kind of get connected to those things. But my advice is if you're stepping into the DEI world for the first time, find out what you want to do and get connected with those specific areas um, as you're jumping in. And I would just add quickly to what Brooke is saying understand what you mean by DEI space, because I get all kinds of, well, we all get all kinds of comments and questions, conversations from people who want to get involved in DEI work, but then ignore their colleagues who are from diverse backgrounds or can't get along with their colleagues who are from diverse backgrounds. And that to me, honestly, is part of the work. How am I going to help you send you to professional development for X over here in this larger landscape of DEI, but you are really mistreating your colleague who happens to be a person of color or transgender. I, I think that's what I would like for people to also consider. That's awesome. Um, so we're just about out of time. So one, thank you again to our panel. Give them a big virtual round of applause for all the <laughs> amazing insights and I'll quickly pass it back over to Jen if you have any closing comments um, before we close out. Yes, thank you and um, thank you Jamila to you as well. Amazing job moderating this panel. It was such a great session. We already had multiple people asking if they can get a recording of this. Uh, I did forget to mention the beginning, we did record this. We will provide the link. We can email that out to you and also follow us on LinkedIn because we will post it there. Um, we do have a boardroom email. So if you want to make sure you get the email, the link to the video email to you, which a couple people requested, please email us at connect at to the boardroom.com. I did put that in the chat and we'll make sure to email you the link as well. Um, but again, thank you to everybody. We have an exciting session coming up at the end of February. More details to come on that. So mark your calendar for Tuesday, February 28th at noon Eastern Standard Time. Um, and really thank you for everyone for joining us. Hope this session was helpful um, and have a wonderful rest of your day. Awesome. Thank you. Can't wait to future Thanks, events. Everyone. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. Thanks, y'all. Bye. Thank you.